So, a very warm welcome to all of you. A warm welcome to those of you joining us from the United States. Good morning. And for those of us joining from Europe, good evening. And for Eric Schmidt, who's our special guest today, a very big thank you for having made yourself available for the special session on a new global digital order. My name is Elisabeth von Hammerstein. I'm a program director here at Kerber Stiftung in Berlin, which is hosting this special session, the final session of the Berlin Foreign Policy Forum today, together with the Espen Institute Germany. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. My name is Rüdiger Lenz and a very warm welcome for me too. We all know that we are living in an interconnected world. We all just experienced it, it at the Kerber Forum, which Liz just referred to throughout the day. And many of us are proud of being members of that interconnected world, but others are fearing the accelerating speed of the technological advancements in this field. Or as Alan Turing once stated, and I quote, machines take me by surprise with great frequency, end quote. So where do we stand now and which way will we choose for the future of digitization and the future of our globe? This session will be as much about predictability as about values, about regulation and the need for a global digital contract. We could not think of anyone better to talk to and to discuss this topic than Eric Schmidt, technological entrepreneur, big thinker, and certainly one of the most competent persons to talk to. Thank you for joining us. I couldn't Thank agree more. Uh, uh, thank you both for having me. Thank you for letting me come in and zoom in from California. Thank you to co both Korber as well as the Aspen Institute with which I've had a very long association. So I'm looking forward to the session. Great, so are we. <laughs> just a few words of introduction of Eric Schmidt. Rüdiger just mentioned it. He is really one of the most influential figures in tech. He's currently the chair of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And as all of you probably know, the former CEO and chairman of Google. He is the co-founder of Schmidt Futures, author of several books, including the New York Times bestselling book, The New Digital Age, Transforming Nations, Businesses and Our Lives and host of a new podcast, which is called Reimagine, in which he talks to the world's leaders in government, business, science, and technology about their visions of the future of society after COVID-19. So to all of you who are just listening and one short remark, housekeeping rule, so to speak, um, one short uh, advice, Please ask your questions via the Q&A button at, uh, and submit your questions by Twitter using the hashtag Berlin Forum. We will then call up your questions and we'll transfer them directly to Eric. Eric, let's start with COVID-19, which was just mentioned. The current crisis has changed our life tremendously, all aspects of our lives. Undoubtedly, there's also been a catalyst for tech adoption by AI-driven solutions for finding new vaccines, by contact tracing apps, which we all more or less experienced throughout the last month, or edge computing in trying to help the suffering. While big tech companies seem to flourish throughout the crisis, small businesses seem to suffer. And we also make the experience that state-funded tech programs are gaining more significance. So how do you evaluate the way the pandemic has impacted global health and tech dynamics. Well, so first, thank you. Um, let me say from the out, out, outset that the primary job of governments is to keep their citizens safe and healthy and prosperous. And by any measure, the vast majority of the Western governments have failed. The failures in Europe are well understood. The failure in America is tantamount to a tragedy beyond proportions. The fact that in the United States, people who were elected did not believe in science, did not li li uh, listen to the advice of medical health experts, would go down in history as one of the great, great tragedies. 
and an awful lot of people have died early. Uh, there are many estimates as to the excess deaths, but let me just tell you, say that there was another way that was not chosen, and that's a genuine disaster for America. And I suspect that Europeans will come to the same view in some of the European countries. Um, the consequence of the pandemic is really profound. Uh, and there's a lot of negatives. There's a few positives. The negatives are most obviously health and life and death and all of that, the loss of education. The pandemic is uh, much worse for people who are in minorities and in poor economic and health situations. In America, where there's not universal health care, uh, I'll give you an example, Hispanics and African Americans are falling ill and dying at a rate of four times worse than Caucasians. How is that okay? It's not. Um, the pandemic has also accelerated digitization. We all knew that digitization was coming. It's been coming for 20 years. And in many things, things that would have taken a decade have now occurred in six months or eight months. And I don't think that we're going to go back to the way it was before. I think that the digital world will have advanced in particular with electronic commerce, working from home, working from the office, salespeople will be able to travel by Zoom rather than by airplane. Uh, most of these are positive. Um, as you pointed out, the economic damage has not been to the tech sector, but it has been to small mom and pop shops and other businesses that were not digitized and were unlikely to benefit from digitization. So in that sense, the pandemic, has excel which is a terrible tragedy, has accelerated digitization, which we should have expected. Eric, let me just stick to that point because you just mentioned the bright side of it. It has accelerated the speed and that had, it has its positive sides. But you also said that the Western societies and governments fail. Does that mean that China, an autocratic state, which suppressed it much earlier with other measures, is the better model? Well, there's no question that democracy is a better model, but democracy failed us in this case. Uh, in a pandemic, you have to act quickly and aggressively to contain the spread. And this particular disease, the majority of the spread is asymptomatic. That is, people are unknowingly infecting others. Had the government sat down and explained all this in a clear way and built incentives for people to follow those rules, we would have had, have had far fewer deaths. Um, with respect to technology, uh, there are many things that the governments could have funded that they did not. In particular, if you look in Asia, in, in democracies like Taiwan and Korea and so forth, they have very rapid testing regimes and very rapid test and trace maneuvers. These are in democracies, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it has taken a very long time in the West to build that kind of system. I believe the only way to control this virus is an aggressive amount of testing. If you look on any measure, the amount of testing that's being done in the West and in particular in the United States is abysmal. And the reason that we have all these questions like should the schools be open? We're taking guests, are the uh, restaurants being closed? Are the bars being closed? Are because we can't test and find the answer. It's as though we're fighting a war without data. So if you're looking beyond COVID-19, what would you say are the long-term effects? And maybe you already mentioned some, but what would be your major lessons learned about applying technology to combat global pandemics? Well, I think there will be many, many people who will review this and they'll all conclude the same thing, which is that when you have a pandemic which is highly infectious, you have to act quickly. And you have to make, you have to have a real conversation with your citizens and you have to give up some short-term rights of assembly and you have to wear a mask. Uh, you know, the funny thing about people who are objecting a mask in the United States is these are all people who wear clothes and they don't run around naked. So they're, there's, they're, they're willing to be forced to wear clothes, but not a mask, right? And you could argue that the mask is far more important in terms of the death rate that it causes if you're busy infecting people. So there's this weird logic that doesn't make any sense. But, but I digress. I think the most important thing is that the systems of government have to have some amount of community health surveillance in the sense of watching for the disease and aggressively getting out after it. There are many ways of doing this, right? But the important thing, the technologies exist for anonymous tracing and so forth and so on, but we chose not to do it. 
That's the only conclusion you can come to. Eric, when we started this session, we asked ourselves about the big question, do we need a global digital order? And what does it mean? How, sh how should it look or could it look like? I mean, you just mentioned the different approaches to the pandemic, which showed how different we are in our answers and how many of these answers weren't appropriate. So has the pandemic shown that there is a need for a digital order and how could it look like? Um, I doubt there will be a digital order because digital is everything. Uh, so in the sense that, that the internet was this sort of thing on the side that we all played with, you could have imagined that. But now that the internet, broadly speaking, and digitization, broadly speaking, is at the core of how societies work, every difference between societies will be magnified in the digital world. They, the lesson is that digitization does not cause peace and well-being. Digitization enables various powerful components within a society to continue in whatever they were doing. And so digitization allowed China to become more authoritarian. Digitization allowed America to become more diffuse and disorganized, right? The two are, they're, they're not, they're, they're clearly incompatible, but they're both logical outcomes of a society, the differences in between, between societies. Going back to the pandemic, I think a reasonable reading of this is that governments that were well-functioning and clear-headed and strong are likely to have gotten their citizens through the pandemic better than governments that were disorganized, confused, or pitted against each other. And I think that's an important lesson to be learned. Um, broad, more broadly speaking, I would say you could imagine you would write a book which said that, that, Amer that humans would, would face a threat from outer space or a virus or something like that. Um, and that we would have a meeting and we would all agree to fight the virus together. And that is precisely what did not happen, right? It precisely tore us apart to the point where we don't agree on all sorts of things, including distribution of vaccine information and things like that. So that does not bode well for the global challenges that we will face next. And it tells us something about how we're choosing to run the world. You just said, you just mentioned that there is no, no global order and there couldn't be a global order, but the opposite of order is disorder and disruption. So how to live then with disruption and how could AI help sort of organize disruption or other, in another way asking you, do we need more regulation to tame the beast and all the different directions which are included in the tech developments which we're facing right now? So I'd like to make, um, a somewhat annoying point, which is that whenever I'm in a European audience and with very, very smart Europeans, one of the first questions that is asked is regulation. That does not happen in America. Right. Yeah. And, I, I'm, and I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I think it's important to say that it depends on your model of how digital order will be achieved. I think the evidence is the following. The China model is now well understood and is successful for at least a, a billion or two billion people in the world. And the China model is intense uh, competition within the country, very uh, brutal government regulation and the government promoting national champions. It's a specific model that works for China. It's very different from what we do. What is the Western answer? And the Western answer is this extraordinarily, extraordinary innovation engine that has powered drugs and cars and technologies and you know everything that has built around us and is now powering AI. I would never want to shut down that innovation engine given that China is the competitor. And what I, what I find now is that um, the US and Europe spend all their time bickering over things when what the US and Europe should do is we should unite around the common values of democracy in the internet age, and we should collectively build systems that reflect those values, and we should work really hard to get those systems to be adopted globally because we have a competitor. And I think without the competitor, we might be in a situation. 10 years ago, I spent all my time dealing with German concern over this, French concern over this, American concern over this. I would argue to you now that those are not very important compared 
to the fact that we have a well-organized competitor under a different system. So let's move the issue of regulation to the third part of our conversation, maybe, and let's get into a topic that is probably more of your of US concern, which is the race for digital dominance. Um, you just briefly touched upon it. The US, I guess, is still the digital superpower. 15 of the world's top 50 digital technology companies, excluding fintech and e-commerce firms, are American. And most of the others are based in states that are very closely allied with the United States. Japan, Western Europe, Taiwan, South Korea, Mexico. The remaining eight, I think, are Chinese. However, and you briefly touched upon that, some argue that in multiple areas, including facial and voice recognition, including 5G technology, digital payments, quantum communications, and the commercial drone market, China is catching up very fast. And some even argue it has already surpassed the United States. So I wonder, do you agree with this assessment? And is or will the US be able to keep up with the Chinese development or will we have to prepare for a new digital superpower? Um, so another way of making your point is to look at the top eight companies in valuation in the world. Five of them are in the United States. Three of them are in China. They're all tech companies. So tech, which I've been part of for my whole life, went from being something on the corner to being the most valuable, most impactful, and perhaps most controversial companies in the world because they largely work on information. Um, I chair this AI commission for the National Security um, of the United States, which is appointed by Congress. And we spend a lot of time looking at this question. Um, the West can continue our leadership in digital, and in particular in artificial intelligence, if collectively we do a number of things. We need to double or more our R&D budget. Uh, this is true in the United States. This is also true in Europe. Um, another uh, soft point, soft, soft and unpleasant point about Europe is that Europe underfunds its universities relative to the, to the United States. One of the best things that Europe could do would be to give more money to the universities. The universities are fantastic. They are, un, they are well, relatively terribly funded compared to America. Uh, we talk a lot about needing for a national research network so that people can build on these complicated platforms and get access to data. We speak a great deal about the fact that we need high skills immigration. Um, it, is grant, it is taken for granted that really brilliant people are working in this area, and we think they should all work on the projects that we're talking about and not on ancillary projects, especially not in China, which means, for example, that high, high skills Chinese graduate students should be welcome in Europe and the United States. We also spend an awful lot of time talking about alliances and partnerships, which is why we're on this call. The United States is not at the same physical scale as China, and China has four times as many engineers, and they're very focused on, on both dominance in AI as part of dominance in a number of other industries by, 2020, by 2025 and 2030, respectively. So not only are they doing it, but they also have a plan. Um, Europe has a digitization plan, which does not reflect that priority. It has other priorities that Europeans care about. And collectively, what we should do is we should form a group of, I'll pick 10, 11, 12 countries, which would obviously include Germany, um, of the ones that have the ability to, to operate directly to, to build these new platforms. And in particular, that list should include Japan and India not just Western Europe, which is where we are used to and we are often our partnerships. Eric, here's one first question from Ned Wiley, and he refers to the different approaches to the pandemic in the US and Germany and especially Europe, but especially Germany. He says that uh, the US tried to answer the problem with more unemployment insurance, whereas Europe and especially Germany tried to answer it with Kurzarbeit sort of keep them, but by state subsidies and try to bring them through the crisis to re-employ them after the crisis. So both programs cost a ton of money. So which one is the better one? Well, I would distinguish the German and the US response um, with a simple number. The death rate in the United States is at least five times higher 
than the German, the German death rate. There are estimates that it's up to 20 times higher. Um, so how could that possibly be, right? We have similar uh, uh, cultural background, they're democracies, uh, good friends between each other and so forth. And the answer fundamentally is that the German system, which is a democracy and relatively federalized, that is the states have relative autonomy, acted in concert when a pandemic came in and did the right thing. In America, the president, who clearly did not believe in science, he did not believe what uh, healthcare people were telling him, simply allowed the states to do this. And what has happened is the first wave of states was seen in the blue, the cases were seen in the blue states, which are the large urban centers. And so for a while, there was this perception that this was a disease in the United States that would take out uh, blue states, but not re Republican states. Today, we have a situation where there is a horrific pandemic in the Midwest, largely in Republican states, and largely due to, their go to the governors who made up their own decisions, not closing down bars and restaurants, not requiring masks, and not doing the things that the other states have done. Um, History will judge this decision a deadly decision. That would never have happened in Germany. Let me bring in another question from the audience because we already have several coming in. The question is about the future of human beings with implementation of artificial intelligence and the negative consequences for humanity. How do you think governments and corporations will tackle the future huge unemployment caused by partly by artificial intelligence? So it's interesting that your questioner has some assumptions in, in their question, which I don't agree with. Um, there's a great deal of evidence that the economic systems in the future will create more jobs. Um, the jobs are created because of interconnectedness for globalization, because the GDP is growing, there's more investment, there's more innovation, all that kind of stuff. Um, the question to me is what kind of jobs? And in the United States, which I'm more familiar with, there are shortages of reasonably skilled jobs in the sense that they, there are positions that are open for people. And there's, a, there's, there, and there's lots of, of people who are looking for these unskilled jobs. And so economists discuss this as a general term of a bifurcation. There's a, a very powerful services sector, which is relatively unskilled and relatively low wages. And there's a very powerful group that is sophisticated knowledge workers who get all the money and the wages and the growth. I think a fair reading of this is that AI, unless we do something, will increase that gap. The jobs will be there, but the inequality will increase because the AI will empower the knowledge worker. It doesn't mean there'll be fewer jobs. My guess is there'll be more of a gap and probably true in most countries. Europe has less inequality, but the same trend is present in Europe. You look at this in the service, in the tensions over the service agreements and things like this. Um, and what I would say to you about the solution to that is for the people who are working on AI to, to use AI to take people who are unskilled and make them more skilled. And I defy you to argue that taking someone who's relatively unskilled and making them smarter is a bad thing. And we think that with AI in terms of learning systems and collaborative systems is likely to be the case. Most people think that AI means in, uh, autonomous robots, which is they get from movies. The vast majority of AI use probably 99.99% will be humans and, and humans and computers interacting that each does things differently and together they, they do it better. That's the big dream and that's your vision, but let's come back to what you just mentioned before when you said, here are the big five in the US, three biggies in China and no one in Europe. So we are lagging behind you, rightly so described the gap, and you said education and maybe research and development might be, may, might be the way out. But it looks like that Europeans choose another way. They want to be digital sovereign. They want to go a third way between the two big superpowers. Is that the wrong choice or is it totally misleading? I think it is the wrong choice. And um, for one thing, the West has a set of cultural values that we all agree with, and we are collectively stronger when we act together. The bifurcation that you're describing where Europe goes its own way 
probably on balance hurts European citizens because they get they don't get the efficiency of the global platforms. It hurts the United States because we don't get as strong a market for our ideas and goods and so forth. And it hurts us both relative to global competition. I think it's crucial that we come to some collective understandings of shared values between the West um, and not just in national security, also in terms of free speech, in terms of the way people communicate with each other, in terms of open access, ideally with respect to people uh, going back and forth. You forget that one of the greatest strengths of America has been the Atlantic Partnership post-World War II. And the Atlantic Partnership drove the vast majority of the economic growth and the technology innovation until maybe five or 10 years ago. So we, all of us who are alive today, benefited enormously from all of those airplanes shuttling people back and forth from the United States and the West. Those airplanes are roughly now not flying. Um, I think it's a terrible problem. We benefit by the proximity, by the collaboration, by the, the human closeness, by the family structures, by the economic, joint, by the economic investments and so forth. And, it, and, and if I were a European listening to this, I'd say, well, he's obviously taking an American view here, but I have heard this uh, third way argument. I just don't buy it. I think it's just not in your interest. There's another third way which someone refers to. Ned Wiley wants to challenge you on the uh, assumption that we are totally underfunded as far as research goes, because he said, if you're looking on universities only, you're totally wrong because we have so, so state institutes like Fraunhofer, Leibniz, academic institutions which are doing part of the ground research work and you have to take them into account. So is the difference between the US and Europe still that valid and still that big? So, so with respect to your questioner, I just don't agree. I've spent a lot of time looking at this. If you take the research institutes and the graduate programs and the R&D funding in Europe, it's off by a factor of three or four or five. The amount of money that American research universities and their associate research institutes has is enormously larger. And you see that in many, many fields. Um, and I think it's part of the issue. I, having run this part of Google, I can tell you the people and the professors and so forth in Europe are fantastic. We had 1.10 thousand engineers in Europe. We know how good they are. And yet why have these technologies not created the kind of innovation that it should have? It's a structural problem. It's time for Europe to, to be, have an honest conversation about that. So let's talk about differences and commonalities between the United States and Europe, because you just mentioned that. And you already mentioned that Europe has taken on a leading role when it comes to regulation. But with the incoming Biden administration, I think there are signs that um, he will be tougher on regulating big tech companies. And I guess one of the important decisions will be how he approaches the issues of competition. And he will have to decide whether to push for new antitrust legislation, which was also um, called, called for by a recent report by David Sisselin, the Democratic head of the antitrust subcommittee in the House of Representatives. And I wonder to what extent do you agree with this approach and um, where is the United States moving more in the direction of Europe? So I, I would say there's, there's two things. So in the fractured politics of America, there are two things that are widely agreed to in Congress. One is this issue of China as a future threat to America. And the second is concerns over what you're calling big tech. So you are correct that for example, over a 10 year position, things have changed. It's also true that over those 10 years, those companies are far larger and far more embedded in everyone's daily life. So with respect to the question about antitrust, which I think is what you're really asking, I am not in favor of using antitrust to solve this problem. It, uh, antitrust is an extremely blunt instrument and what happens in the history of antitrust in America, and I should say, by the way, the American antitrust law is different from European, so let's keep them separate. The companies get themselves organized. There's this huge lawsuit. It goes on for a very long time, and it goes well past the time 
when the technology that's at issue is relevant. Um, and I'm, I'm not endorsing it or criticizing or whatever, I'm just saying those are true. You'd be far better for the West and for Europe to try to figure out what you don't like about what big tech is doing and regulate the things which you believe are excesses. And it's hard, it turns out it's really hard to write down what you want. And partly that's because the tech industry reflects the cultural values of the company, the countries that they're in. So I used to say at Google, um, we, make a, we, we make a very hard decision every nanosecond because we rank everything. Now, if you want to rank, if you want to control and regulate our ranking, write an algorithm that the government can tell us how to rank. By the way, you'll discover that it's really, really difficult. Really, really difficult. And so before we go the regulation path, which is the first idea that comes in these European elite conversations, why don't instead we figure out a way to get European companies to be operating at the global stage? I'm a, huge, I'm a big Spotify fan, you know, blah, blah. There's all sorts of examples of very, very good European firms that are coming. Why don't we figure out a way to get them to be globally dominant and powerful? Rick, thank you for giving us the way out of the crisis by, by asking European companies to become as big as the American ones and then talk on the same level. Here's a question which goes to the core of the problem which you just mentioned, Sebastian Geschwind. He asked, what role should governments play to avoid concentration of market power, data power with big tech companies without stifling innovation? That's so, exactly what he asked. So, so a good question. So um, um, I was a very good friend of uh, a number, I think the number two in Germany, his name was Sigmar. And we did a session in Berlin. You mean, you before, you mean Sigmar yes. Gabriel? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sigmar Gabriel. And, um, and I think he's no longer in power, but in any case, uh, he's a great guy. And so we did a seminar, which was on this in Berlin. And it was the roughest seminar I've done in years because it was this question after this question after this question. And the presumption is that there's something wrong with structural scale. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact of the matter is some of these technologies naturally lead to scale solutions. That's the core problem. And in AI, because large data pools are likely to um, are, are likely to allow for large winners that use large amounts of data, we're likely to end up with new companies that are fairly large companies. A different way of asking your comment, Rudiger, is to say, how do we get some of the great, huge AI companies to be built in Europe? What would it take? It's a thought experiment. And the first thing they have to do is they have to have access to data. <laughs> which is difficult in Europe. And in China, it's extremely easy. In America, it's sort of a mixture. The second thing is that they need access to capital. Well, there's pretty good capital access in Europe now. The third is they have to have access to people. Well, again, we have great people in Europe. So what's preventing us from creating that? I'd much rather have Europe be starting this conversation by saying, we have one of the great new AI platforms because we figured out a way to get the training data and the system to be a European solution. Liz, I think you're on. I'm just scrolling through the questions. Keep them coming, by the way. There are many, and we hope to tackle as many as, as possible. Um, there's one question on democratic, common democratic values of the Transatlantic Alliance again. And um, I'll read it. The thesis of many common values is being challenged by many Europeans, which is one reason why the political narrative of digital sovereignty is becoming increasingly strong in Europe and why a technical and digital independence from, the, from US companies is being implemented. So what can and should European or companies in general and individuals do concretely to meet those concerns? Well, um, I mean, let me give you an example. Germany has been very concerned about data localization and your chancellor has spoken a great deal about data localization for many years. And that makes sense to me because if I were a German government, 
I would want to have access to the data that involves my citizens. Makes perfect sense. Um, so there's a way to implement that that is both reasonable and also scalable. And indeed, the cloud companies are largely allowing you to have a German cloud, right, et cetera. So that's an example of an accommodation that's a reasonable accommodation. Um, so, so I think, I think if you, if instead of using all the sort of the big words of, oh my God, these Americans and so forth, they're destroying us. What I would rather do is figure out a way to achieve your objective in such a way that you don't throw the baby out with the bath, bath water. The problem with self-reliance is that Europe does not have a semiconductor industry. It's all basically now in Taiwan and in Asia. So that's a problem. Um, in software, there are areas where Europeans are very good in software, but you don't cover all the areas. And finally, it's just a scale game. I'd much rather have European and American firms operating together, sharing information, operating on open source platforms, working together to make the world the values that we collectively care about, which are largely democratic and as opposed to authoritarian, and win against the China model. Let's stick to that that global issue and global threat at the moment, because I think that was what we experienced under President Trump, that he wanted us to fall in line with his very sort of antagonistic China policies. Will that also be the question of the Biden administration asking us what our position towards China is and asking well, us to join forces with the US as far as formulating a common uh, China policy? Um, so I should disclose that I have been a longtime Biden supporter, contributor to the campaign, you know, et cetera. So I would give you a biased answer. And I would say that the last four years violated a number of aspects of common sense. The threats and the breaking of the NATO alliance and the alliance with Europe was a big mistake during the Trump administration because we are stronger together. And I think that that correctly annoyed our European friends as I would be. Um, I'm quite sure that the new administration under President Biden will work hard to strengthen our relationships transatlantically, that we are stronger together, bigger. With respect to China, I honestly don't know. Um, at the moment, we're in a relatively simple and mechanistic fight. They're bad, we're good, and so forth. I don't think that that comports to an ideal grand strategy outcome. I've worked very hard on this. Uh, I'm writing a book on these areas in AI with Dr. Kissinger. So I spent a lot of time thinking about it. In my own view, is that China's not gonna go away, Russia's not gonna go away, and that we should collectively be in constant discussions with them about both our values and trying to keep things peaceful and not end up in a cold or a hot war. I think the danger of an escalation um, is possible. It's certainly possible that we are, we're in a situation that looks historically like 1908 or 1906 before World War I in Europe. Uh, where there were all these tensions, but people didn't understand the possibility of, of losing control. So I think it's crucial that we be communicating with China, trading with China, understanding what they're doing, trying to make sure we're doing better than them, and trying to keep them as contained as we can. Talking about this rivalry, I would like to present to you um, our latest numbers of the Berlin Pulse that we do once a year with regard to what the German public thinks about German foreign policy. And this year we asked them how likely is it that a US-China confrontation turns into a such a cold war that you just mentioned. And Germans are quite divided. 49% think that it's somewhat or very likely and 47% think it's unlikely. The US respondents, we also together with the Pew Research Institute are asked the same questions in the US. They are more concerned. They 59% think that a cold war is somewhat or very likely. And coming back to the role of Europe in this uh, so-called Cold War. I would like to ask you how Europe can prevent being sandwiched or maybe you could even say being crushed between or by these two digital superpowers in such a rivalry. So it's, it's very important we not get into a Cold War. 
because the Cold War will split all of the technology platforms. It will also split all the communications. It will also lead to both a loss of innovation and an increase of the danger of a real conflict. And I work with the US military, and I can tell you that you do not want to end up in a war between China and the United States. It's just a really, really bad thing. So we need collectively to avoid that. So I think we should all work very hard to have some kind of reasonable structure which recognizes China's right to exist as a country, um, allows China to continue to achieve its objectives, and allows us also to compete and win in the innovation game. Here is a comment from um, X Yedi. He greets you because he has been with you at the MSC, the Munich Security Conference where you mentioned Sigma Gabriel. And he says that disruptive thinking and innovation will not only come from governments, it is too slow and conservative to take real risks, but from civil society and foundations. What would be your advice for a non-government organization playing the role of inventing the next big thing in tech like DARPA? Anything on the horizon, Eric? Well, I think the model that I'm familiar with works really well. And the model that I'm familiar with is that you have universities where innovation occurs. You have entrepreneurs who are often young, inexperienced, but driven, who change the world. This is true in biology. It's true in energy. It's true in technology. It's true in aviation. And we forget that this is how every one of these industries that we take for granted now were built. So we do have a model of innovation that has worked well. Um, with respect to innovation, it's almost impossible to see how governments can be innovators because governments are not designed to innovate. They're designed to be risk averse, which is reasonable. So a smart government has to recognize where the innovation and the disruption will come from. And that's almost always the private sector of some of one way or the other. As I mentioned, even in China, which is certainly a command and control economy, the, the thing that Americans and perhaps Westerners don't understand is that the entrepreneurs in China are the toughest and roughest and most capable of all the entrepreneurs that I've ever seen. The scale of competition, the scale of investment, the scale which which they move is remarkable. So even there, They've managed to get the innovation out of what they consider private sector, and that innovation then they seize as a national asset. I would like to come back to China just for a second, because I feel like uh, there are still many more questions on that. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from Nadia Yang, speaking as a German Chinese, as she says. What role would, will citizens and the youth of Chinese American or Chinese Europeans play to maintain a sustainable and peaceful relationship within the China-US-Europe triangle? What are their responsibilities? Well, it's important to remember that Chinese government is a monopoly and they're not particularly interested in anyone's opinion. And so the, the best thing that I can think of for a Chinese European or Chinese American is to work in the, in the country that they live in, not China, to make the technologies and opportunities that they take for granted in the West even stronger. Um, talking about China, uh, one way to understand the China threat is to take a look at 5G. And the combination of Huawei, 5G, the way the state worked, the way they gave 200 megahertz each of the three telcos and so forth, has propelled China as a scale leader in 5G. By the way, the technology leader is in fact in South Korea and Japan, but in terms of scale, China wins. Why does scale matter? Because scale allows you to define standards, it allows you to build new platforms, it defines, allows you to build new businesses. It's gonna be very difficult for collectively the West to beat that 5G leadership from China without a change in our strategy. That's a good example of this point. You're a barking dog, I think. <laughs> Eric, let me, 
Let's if I may, one. let me. Sorry, let me just okay. take the chance because we're talking about 5G and we have a question from Alexander Kulitz from the German Parliament um, on Huawei. And he asks if preventing Huawei and their technolog technological innovation is the right strategy in view of preventing a Cold War. Um, so Huawei, um, Huawei is state funded and there's plenty of evidence of the use of Huawei for various forms of surveillance. So it's reasonable to be concerned about it. The policy failure here is not the problem of Huawei, but the problem of what is an alternative to Huawei. And I believe it is a national security issue. This is my personal opinion now. It is a real national security for the West that we don't have a viable, scalable solution, at, literally at scale in 5G, that's an alternative to Huawei. Uh, there are a number of very good uh, tech firms, mostly in Europe, working on this, um, and there are solutions coming. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of 5G use is in Asia and not in the West, and that's a strategic problem. And again, what happens is people complain. Uh, um, in this case, America is doing the same thing Europeans do about America. Uh, Americans are complaining about Huawei rather than saying, what's our solution? So I would like, as part of our transatlantic partnership, I'd like us to come up with a credible, strong 5G solution of the similar scale to Huawei's solution in China. To give you the numbers, they're on the order of 600,000 towers in China and 150 million users. And those numbers are growing dramatically, dramatically. Eric, you just mentioned uh, the scaling and also which uh, sort of then uh, builds the price, which is uh, very not only competitive, which is outstanding. So uh, you just mentioned the European firms. Why not then bring Nokia and Ericsson together, get funding from the US and fund from the European Union and make them sort of a real competitor in that field? And I don't see any movements in that direction. Well. Uh, I don't know about the specifics enough in Europe to answer this, but the way China would solve this problem is they would say to Nokia and Ericsson and others, you guys need to compete and whichever one of you produces the best solution, we will then provide the necessary funding. So it's important to understand the difference in industrial policy. The way you said it was take the companies and put them together. That's not what China would do. China would have them compete brutally and then pick one of them, right? Pick, pick one or maybe a nut, one that doesn't exist and then champion that for, again, under enormous pressure and funding. And that's how you win in a national strategy game. That's sort of the warrior game. Let me come back to what we started with, the value thing and how it is affected by digitization and how digitization and AI might also be helpful in establishing more democratic values or foster them. We all know that we have to fight disinformation and, and false news and what have you. Can digitization also help to tackle that problem or is it part of the problem? Um, it's clearly part of the problem and it's also gonna be part of the solution. Um, uh, there are many, many examples of what I consider to be errors in this case. Um, Facebook recently, a few weeks ago, announced that they were not going to allow deniers of the Holocaust to continue posting on Facebook. Now, frankly, I thought that had been litigated some number of decades ago. So that's an example of a very late decision that should have been made a long time earlier. Uh, I don't know why they wouldn't have done that. In Google, in YouTube, we had a situation where we were showing uh, an incendiary video. And then the person, we, our recommendation engine would then send them another one and another one and another one. And after 10 or 12, these people who are perhaps emotionally upset or worried or what have you, or not educated on the subject would become very, very mobilized, right? So we made a change where the videos are still there, but we don't recommend them after the first one. So that's an example of a small change, which is incredibly important to providing a healthy society. And I think we can find such examples. I do think that misinformation is going to get much worse. 
in the United States, um, the way it worked was some sort of falsehood would be spread and then the president would retweet it, which would legitimize it. Presumably that won't happen after January 20th. So maybe that cycle will stop. But the AI tools will allow for very sophisticated misinformation campaigns and they're democratized. So there's something called GANs, which allow you to generate false images. There's every reason to think that we will be awash in misinformation and that the examples that I just gave you will be precursors to much more significant in, uh, in, uh, uh, engagement in limiting misinformation. Uh, what's interesting was Europe, in a typical European way, um, a few years ago published or established a, a division which looked at all the false news and it reported on what news was correct. And no one followed it, although their work was very good. So the problem is deeper. It's not a truth problem. People who are intellectuals, like the majority of people who are on this call, think that if you just explain something, smart people will figure it out. That's not how human beings really work. Human beings have anchoring bias. They get excited about stuff. There's lots of evidence that emotional messages are retweeted many times more than, than uh, rational messages. Um, maybe this doesn't happen in Germany because everyone there is very smart, but certainly in the United States, this is a problem. You get the idea. You just told us the recipe of Trump's success. I think that was the core point of what you just were telling. So let's, well, let's talk about the, the recipe. Sorry. The, the important thing to say about Trump is although he doesn't think he's lost the election, everyone else does. And so uh, we will have a new leadership regime in, in January 20th. I'm sure that they will address these issues in a more, uh, in a more sophisticated way than the Trump White House. That's exactly what I would like to ask you about the new administration. And I mean, President-elect Biden is kind of seen as a bridge builder. And when you look at the political side and, and some possible legislation, to what extent do you think he can shore up American resilience to foreign and domestic uh, disinformation? And then maybe second, um, what role does international cooperation play in this regard? So a lot will depend on how the politics play out. Um, the most likely scenario is that the Senate will remain Republican and that the House will, it will be Democratic and the President will be Democratic. That's the most likely scenario. And we don't know whether the Republicans will go along with the various Democratic ideas and changes. So we, I don't think it's possible to answer your question as a legislative matter. Uh, the, the presidency in America has a lot of uh, executive power And so I'm sure the president will use their, his executive power to do precisely what you described. And the president, as we learned with Trump, uh, has an awful lot of power with respect to foreign relationships, immigration, and things like that. So you can be sure that Tony Blinken, uh, the new secretary of state, will be very busy flying around trying to shore up things. And he has said this many times, so I know he'll do that. Here is one question from Wolfgang, who waited for a long time, and it goes directly at your private property, Eric, because he asks, what do you think about the OECD and G20 proposal of digital taxation? And this goes very close to what the Greens just uh, sort of put in their party platform over the last weekend to tax the big digital companies because they think they have fattened their belly and there's now pay time to sort of finance all the infrastructural and climate changes necessary. What's your private and what's your sort of professional meaning on that, take on that? Um, I'm generally not opposed to um, taxation when there are huge new sources of wealth and so forth. Um, what I did not like in Europe was the fact that Europe couldn't agree on a tax regime. And so the criticism that I have received over my years of doing this was that we used legal means to operate correctly in Europe, such as having an Ireland headquarters and things like that. Well, those were the rules that were written down by the Europeans. So to the degree that the OECD comes up with a new, reasonably rational and global tax policy, That's probably a good thing. I don't know the specifics, so I couldn't comment on it. But um, I'll give you an example. There was a, 
I can't remember if it was in France or Germany some years ago, where there was a law passed that was called the Google tax. And it had the property that it, ne that it specifically did not tax Google. So again, that just drives me insane. So I think a, 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 an OECD process where there's a global tax regime where everybody's following the same rules is probably not a bad case. In Google's case, and again, I'm not at Google anymore, so I'm not speaking for Google, I'm just saying historically, um, everyone complained when we paid less taxes uh, to them, but there were no people who complained when we paid more taxes to them. I have another question from Europe, and because we are already uh, also receiving questions through Twitter, and Thomas Kleine Brockhoff from the German Marshall Fund asked about European sovereignists, uh, sovereignists like Macron argue, if you do not store data in a European legal area, you're not sovereign with regard to knowledge and information. The US has already proven that data are not safe in the US, at least not by European standards. So how do you respond to the sovereignty argument? Um, I don't agree with the, the most of what the questioner said, but, but I would say the following. I think it's fine for governments to have data sovereignty requirements as long as they are implementable in a way that's rational. So for example, as I mentioned, uh, I happen to know the Google Cloud has systems which allow for data sovereignty throughout Europe. That seems like a fine outcome, right? I don't agree that that is the, uh, what's happened in Europe is people have become obsessed about this question about data because they, they conflate it with privacy but I don't think that's what, uh, it's, fine to, it's fine to do it and it's fine to follow those laws and we certainly should do that. I don't think that's going to lead to greatness. I think it's a tactic, it's not the winning strategy, it's part of a strategy. Eric, you gave us a lot of advice during our talk, which I think uh, was very highly appreciated how the Europeans should operate better and can use their sources and their, their, their abilities in a better way. Here comes a question, uh, which relates to a news which was a couple of days ago went through our uh, news system. Jan Wienig asked, you, be, you decided to become a citizen of Cyprus and by becoming a citizen, citizen there, a citizen to Europe. Is that you want to sort of more engage in Europe? Um, I'd, rather not, I, I'd, rather, I, I'd rather not comment on that, except to say nothing has happened yet. Um, okay. I personally love Europe. Um, I want to make the relationships between America and Europe just like family. I want to get back to the very tight relationships that we had um, during my whole childhood. Um, we are much, much stronger um, when we're together. Uh, when I think about the innovation, the economic strength, um, the people, the innovation um, in Europe, uh, they, I consider them my closest friends. Uh, and, I, and I really believe that. And it's fine to squabble over these, these things and there are differences in the society, but somehow we're using these to magnify differences that don't exist. We are democracies, we have shared values, we have respect for the individual, we are peace loving, we have an agreement called NATO around common security. Um, we've agreed to collaborate on all sorts of information. There's a long, long list. Uh, and I want to make that stronger. The key message I can say from the AI Commission, which I had, is the AI Commission feels this is a huge priority for us. Eric, I think one couldn't have said it better. That was sort of the final word. And I would get back now to Liz. From my point of view, that was a great discussion with you. We enjoyed it both very much, my co-host and myself. Thank you so, so much. And I hope that our audience also enjoyed and was enlightened by your very precise and very forthcoming remarks. Thank you, Eric. Back to Liz. Oh, thank you. Thank you also from my side and also on behalf of Kerber Stiftung. And 
I think this was an excellent conclusion to our one day Berlin Foreign Policy Forum, which convened for the first time digitally this year. So what a better, there's really no better way to end than with Eric Schmidt. Thank you so much to you, Eric Schmidt. Thank you to Rudy. You called me Liz, so I can call you Rudy. Yes. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for listening in and for actively participating in this session. We're sorry we didn't get to ask all of your questions, but it was just too many. There will be a recording of this session online. And with this, I think it's a wrap. Thank you. Okay. And welcome Thank you guys. to Europe whenever you come. I look forward to getting there as soon as I can. Thank Good. you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.